Today, Sensei Nishioka is going to be uh, speaking about a number of different aspects of his own judo experience on and off the mat. And depending on where he takes us, we will have periodic breaks for questions and answers. With that, it's my privilege to welcome Sensei Hayward Nishioka to the USJF webinar series. And good afternoon, Hayward. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate this opportunity to do this. Uh, I think uh, we have come a long ways in, in our ability to get with people and especially with uh, this idea of Zooming, we're able to cross distances very easily and to share ideas almost face to face. But of course, being there face to face is, is probably the best, but this is, this is second best. And it's all very nice to see everybody's uh, happy faces here. I don't know how happy you'll be after I get through, but uh, it'll be an experience, I think. Well, well, let's get started. Uh, there's a lot of things I want to ask you because of the things I already knew about you and the things that we have discussed before. And my guess is that most of the folks on this on this Zoom uh, will learn a number of things about about Hayward Nishioka. And I want to just start out start off at the beginning, of course. To the, to the mid 1950s and the mid 1950s uh, that's when you walked into a dojo for the very first time what was going on why did you do that and why did you pick judo to use the judo gi well one of the things that happened was uh i used to get into a lot of fights because i was i was born like the movie i was born in east l.a and if, if you know anything about East LA, it's, a, it's kind of a low income area. Uh, and it, it still is, it's, they're trying to gentrify parts of it, but it's still very, very difficult to do. And this is where I kind of grew up and found my way around. Uh, the, after the war, there weren't very many places that uh, were accepting Japanese uh, people of Japanese extraction. And East LA was one of them, mainly because there were in the Boyle Heights area, there were a lot of Japanese before the war. And then after the war, uh, they wanted to come back to that area. I went back to that area uh, along with my, my mother. Uh, and my grandmother, and that's where I kind of grew up. But uh, as things progressed in that area, um, I get into fights. In a sense, it was, uh, there were a lot of Mexicans there. There were a lot of Jewish people there. There were a lot of uh, black people there. there. It was a mixture actually, but more so with Mexicans in the, in the area. And uh, looking at races that, that are trying to get ahead, looking at others saying, well, we're a better uh, fit for the United States than the other person. And the Mexicans were always in, in these little gangs and clubs and groups and I just happened to be picked on uh, mainly because I was a little bit bigger. Also, I was of Japanese extraction. It was right after the war. And I got into a lot of fights because of this one Japanese word, Jap. But the, the funny part of this word is that if you, if you say that to someone that's in Japan, they have no concept of it. It doesn't make any sense to them uh, because they, they say Nipponese, uh, Nippon in, in Japan, but, but it's a derogatory term. And I used to get into fights because of this uh, all the time. And my father or my, actually my stepfather because I never really got a chance to meet my real father he came to a tournament once, 
but he just didn't come up to say hello to me. Uh, he was feeling guilty, I, I would imagine, uh, because he kind of left the, the family and left me uh, without a father in a sense. But I had a stepfather and the stepfather, his name was Dan Oka. He was my first instructor uh, in judo. He was a Nidan and he taught, he taught me how to fall first, but it was all in, in the living room. And he said, look, I can't be there with you every second to help you out in any of the fights that you might get into, but I'm going to teach you some judo. He first took me to uh, this temple in Japan, to a uh, Japanese town. In Japanese town, it's on the second floor, and they had this tournament right on the on the dais where they had uh, that Sunday. Uh, they they had the uh, the Buddha ceremonies going on and the way that they pray and all of this. But after that, they had a tournament and I was sitting down when all of these people in judo uniforms, judo geese, went down the, the aisle way and it just struck me because they were lined up. They were as if they were soldiers were marching down. They got up and suddenly I see people's bodies flying all over the place. I thought to myself, I, I want to do that. I, I want to try that. And so this is uh, how I first saw judo. We went home uh, that evening and then I, I said, I want to I wanna do that. And he said, well, Dan, Dan Oka said, well, you got to learn how to fall first. I did falling for about a month and a half, just doing back falls. And, and this was on hardwood floor, but not hitting, of course, really hard. That would hurt. But just doing a bunch of them. And then he said, OK, after a month and a half, he said, you pretty much know how to fall. You can do this rolling fall. You can do this forward uh, fall. You can do a back fall and a side fall. I'm going to throw you now. I put on a, an old army, small army jacket because I didn't have a judo gi. He didn't have a judo gi. He put on a jacket, his own jacket. He says, just pretend that we have judo gis on. Then he started throwing me. I went over and I went, oh my God. I felt what I saw earlier in that church. And I thought, do it again, do it again. And I said that so many times that he just said, hey, that's enough. I'm tired. <laughs> he said, you got to just take it easy and stay on the side. I'm going to talk a little bit about judo. And he talked. And so that's how I had my first lessons. He was my very first teacher. The next teacher that he took me to, because he said, you can't learn judo just by going with me. You'll have to go to a regular uh, dojo. He found a dojo nearby. It was Senshin Dojo. This is where I... I went and I did a did practice there. We'd roll out these horsehair mats. We'd put on this canvas covering. I'd stub my toes on this canvas covering. So if you look at my toes, I mean, I, I have Neanderthal toes. They just point every which way. <laughs> but I learned about how to step, how to move, how to get into techniques. I gained confidence. And the, the strange part of it was that I, I did this as a means of control and of self-defense. I wanted to be, I want to be that superhero, the one that was throwing people. 
at the at the tournament and uh, it was it was interesting because i that was the first time i got into a judo gi and i did fairly well for a beginner because i was going against some of the brown belts that were there and holding my own i was still getting thrown but i was holding my own and I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. It was a game. And right from the start, I could sense that I could do this. I could do this, and I was physical enough to do this. This is one of the things that I was able to do. I, it helped me out because I thought to myself, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. And what judo does is that it tries to find the best you, the best of what you have in you. And that's, that's what I kind of understood. Yeah, you obviously had a, a knack for this. And if you jump ahead to the end of your teenage years, you were doing something that was a whole lot of people can't possibly aspire to do in judo. So at, at what point, uh, that, that did you realize that there was something to this that you could you could be at least a serious aspirant to the uh, to national or maybe even international competition? There was had to be some time in that first few years where you figured out um, that this I'm good at this I'm I'm really good at this. What was what was the environment or what happened to you during that time? Uh, and did things change for you or what changed to make you into the beginnings of a top end competitor? Well, one of the things that, that happened uh, as I was speaking about inside that dojo where they had the, uh, the mats down with canvas that would kind of curl up and I'd bend my toes all over the place. But I, in spite of that, you know what I found was that uh, here was some place I could fight, release all my energy, pent up energy, uh, but in a constructive way, because judo, unlike a fight, it has rules. Unlike a fight, if you get in danger, someone will stop it. And so that was kind of a big difference. But I continued in that dojo and it eventually moved to a garage, actually. Uh, the first one was in a uh, Shinto temple uh, utility room. That's where the, that dojo was, Senshin Dojo. But it moved to a, a four car garage that was uh, covered with uh, sawdust and the mat was stretched out so you wouldn't stub your toes. And it was, it was a nice place to practice. And that was, that was also in East LA. It was on, it was right by Evergreen in Brooklyn. It was called Brooklyn Avenue at one time. Um, and what I, what I learned there was interesting because um, after the practice, and here's where I'm answering the question of uh, where I thought I might have a chance at, at competition. Here's where um, after practice, they had a little alcove area where parents and where people would just sit down and watch. It wasn't a very big room, but uh, it was next to the dressing room, next to the, the toilet, uh, and next to a big refrigerator. And that refrigerator is packed with beer. And after practice, the senseis would all get together and shut off the light, turn off the light in the main dojo. And then in the little room, they would start talking about judo. They talked about all of the 
the champions and the names of these champions, some of which I've heard from my stepfather, like Kaoka, uh, Kimura, Kimura, who was nine, time, nine times All Japan champion. That was uh, before, during, and after the war. I mean, he was, I met the man later on. Um, he was an instructor to uh, Doug Rogers, who was a Canadian champion, but he was his instructor too. And I met him uh, both in Japan and when he came over. But I would hear all of these names. And Mr. Kimura, while he's talking about these champions, suddenly stopped and said, and I'm, I'm seated in the back, you know, away from everybody, but just still listening because I want to learn about judo and its history. And he said, just like Hayward, Hayward did that throw. I stopped. I, I just, my breath kind of stopped and I was, I was both uh, happy to hear my name being mentioned at that time, but also honored. And also I felt small or something. And I didn't know quite how to react to that. And I just thought, I, I could do this, I could do this. And Kimura continued to talk about how to get into a seoi nage, which he liked. He would throw all the time with seoi nage and throw everybody, including me. But that was my first taste of uh, uh, the idea that I could win. Let me tell you something interesting about some of the tournaments at that time. In the early days, that first tournament that I went to, it was interesting because of this. They had no trophies that they gave away. You know what they gave away? They gave away sacks of rice, shoyu, big shoyu, kegs of shoyu, soy sauce, and all kinds of things that would be uh, noodles and all kinds of things that you could use in, in your home. And that was, that was the prize that some of these people won for their uh, excellence. And the funny part of it is I wanted some noodles. <laughs> I wanted some noodles. I wanted some of that. Not, not just for the noodles, but for the honor of getting the noodles. <laughs> and that was kind of interesting. Let me I think about it. Let me jump ahead for a few years. Uh, I'm gonna, let me see, I'm gonna share my screen because I wanna show people a couple of pictures. Um, here's the first one. All right. When I was 14 years old, I had one of these things. I hope everybody can see it. The official AAU Judo handbook. It cost a dollar, 1963. Complete Judo contest rules, women's judos. And I looked at this book and I went through it. I looked at all the pictures and I skipped all the articles. Uh, but uh, this, this was really my, one of my keys, keys to Judo. The other thing that I wanna show from this uh, is, and I have it right here. These are training partners at the Kodakon. Now, when we just heard that, that Hayward started judo when he was 13, he must have been about 20 years old or thereabouts. And he's a Sandan training in the Kodakon. This is uh, Miki Tsuchida on the left, uh, Haru Inamura in the middle. Uh, uh, Tsuchida was a Sandan, Imamura was a Godan, according to the caption. And then there was that guy, Hayward Nishioka, who was a Sandan, and he'd been in judo, what, six or seven years. And so I thought this was a very interesting uh, photo. And I always rem remembered that oh, this guy, this Hayward Nishioka guy, I'd heard about him. And then uh, he was winning this stuff in the nationals. 
I thought, aha, I know this guy. You went from being a rank beginner at 13 to training in Japan when you were about 20, 19 and 20. And the question is, why did you decide to go to Japan? And, and how did that happen? Uh, like why and how? Um, you, we can say, and I've heard, oh, you were in Japan for two years. I think it was two years. How did that happen? Haruo Imamura, the person that you saw in the middle of the picture, uh, invited me to go as a scholarship. The picture is actually not the Kodokan, but that, that was the old Tenry University dojo. It used to have eight pillars in the middle. That was just only half the size of that, that dojo. It was a huge dojo. And it would be filled with about maybe 70 or 80 uh, judoka, all practicing judo. It was quite awesome to see and to experience that. You don't know what it's like until you get there and then, geez, it's just so many black belts and they're all killers. The one that you saw also on the left-hand side of the picture was Miki Chichita. He was my roommate at Tenry University. And Miki, Miki, had he stayed in the US at the right time, was one of the best judoka. He beat a lot of guys that, that, are, that were European champions and that came to Tenry University and he was one of the best. He was actually my idol. And some of the old timers would know him. Uh, he would do this hanegoshi. It was so quick. In 1959, when I first met him, I asked him to work out. He threw me all over the place with this hanegoshi. And I thought, oh my God, oh my God. I have to figure out a way to stop this. Uh, he was one of the best. Anyway, uh, that was uh, my experience in Japan. It, it, oh, I, I should tell you my worst experience in Japan. One of the things that, that it, it was one of the worst and one of the best. It was with uh, Matsumoto Sensei, who was the head instructor. Matsumoto Sensei was about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, a big, tall Japanese. He was uh, one of the first All Japan champions. He was a co-champion with Kimura. And, and uh, he choked me out, not choked me out. He did it a, a special way. He's a big man. I'm a small guy. I weighed at that time about 150 pounds. We, we were doing mat work and he wanted me to fight harder. And I just couldn't fight any harder. I just was a little tired. He took his legs, wrapped it around me. So my arms are like this. I'm stuck and I can't move. And I'm just trying fighting and he goes fight harder. I go, I'm trying as hard as I can. I can't fight any harder. I saw his hand coming towards me. It's a huge hand. He had big hands. He stuck his thumb in this ear, the little baby finger in the other ear like this and clamped it on my face. He clamped it there and I couldn't breathe in. I couldn't breathe out. I couldn't even bite his hand. I wanted to bite his hand. I couldn't open my mouth. I had a couple of other orifices, but I, they don't breathe. <laughs> and he just knocked me out that way. He knocked me out. And somehow or another, when I came to, he, his hand was coming again. I fought like crazy. Like it was my life that was at, at stake. And he said, that's what you needed. That's how you should fight. Fight 
with all your heart. You know? <laughs> well, somewhere in, in my my primitive brain, I was thinking, shit, I gotta get out of this thing. I gotta, I gotta get away. And it was life threatening. And somehow I had the energy that just exploded somehow. That I got up. So that's that's an interesting way to learn judo. Uh, because uh, it's like one of those things where they go, well, you learn how to swim. And they shove you in the pool. And you don't know how to swim. But you better damn well learn or you're going to drown. <laughs> I, I think those days have passed, even though I and I'm sure a number of other people on this call uh, have experienced something similar by a completely dominant senior person. Uh, sometimes it works and maybe sometimes it doesn't. I'd like to move on. And after I show this next picture, I'd like to open it up for some questions and answers before we go, go further. Uh, there's a, actually, okay, this picture, and I had seen this before, and I was particularly interested in it and going, went back to it uh, when I started to compete in uh, Nagino Kata. And I had heard that there were, that Heiru Nishioka and Jim Bregman were doing Nagino Kata, and they had done Nagino Kata at the All Japan Championships. And this is one of the one of the uh, the moves. This is Yoko Gake, and those of us who have been Uke at least once uh, can can wince at this because it looks it looks like Hayward, who's Uke, and uh, is is going to go down hard. Uh, but anyway, that's one of the one of the two pictures. I'd like to show you one other. Let's hear it for the Ukes and Nagi no Kata. Uh, it's a low camera angle, but it still looks like he is up in the bleachers. Uh, up in the up in the uh, nosebleed seats and about to come crashing down. So I had heard for years that that Hayward and Jim Bregman uh, had performed Nagi no Kata at the All Japan Championships, and here were the pictures. And so Hayward, the the question I have for you, and I've asked you this before, and uh, and how are you two chosen to demonstrate at the All Japan Championships? Uh, that I think it was the second time that. The, that foreigners had been uh, invited to, to participate and to demonstrate Nagi no Kata. What's the story behind this? And, and did you survive? I guess you survived the, the Uranage because you did, were there for Yoko Gake. Uh, no evidence of you surviving after that. Jim was a very good tori. He was really excellent. And we, we practiced and practiced and practiced. I, I took a lot of falls. And we did it so that when we fell, there was only one sound, bap. There wasn't ba bum. It was bap. And we did it almost perfectly, except for the fact that we didn't speed up at the end on the last three. Uh, on the, not the last three, but the, uh, the stemi wazas. You're supposed to speed up just a slight bit, but we didn't do that. And we got criticized for that by one of the uh, high ranking uh, uh, instructors, but we were praised for all the other areas that we, uh, we covered and we did well. So we were both Kenshu Se, Kenshu Se are special uh, students that are picked out by uh, the Kodokan staff, uh, uh, special students that get special instruction on techniques and on kata and things of that nature. So that's how that happened. Uh, we were uh, in the Kenshusei program, which they highlighted at the uh, All Japan Championships. It was really exciting. I have I have a, one other uh, picture I want to show you show uh, everybody, and uh, before I set, before I do that, um, uh, after you came back from Japan, 
uh, in the 60s, you must have been at the peak of your competitive skills. And uh, how did you, I assume that Japan had really helped you train. When you came back to the United States, what was the training like? And did you have to do anything special to maintain a very high level of, uh, of competence, of competitive competence? Well, you always have to practice uh, and you to keep up the skill level. What, what Japan did was it makes you tough, but it doesn't increase your ability to do techniques because you don't get, you don't get to throw as much. You get to throw when people are weaker than you are. And the more you throw, the better your timing gets, the better your understanding of the technique gets. So it wasn't too hard to keep up the throwing portion. It was hard to get, uh, it was hard to get tougher and to get uh, the ability, keep up your ability to resist fast people. That's what was difficult. Yeah. Let me show you this, this uh, picture. People might uh, identify the big guy in the middle. Now, this is from, I think, Hayward, you've told me that this was from the early 60s. Uh, that, was, uh, that was 1964, uh, right at the beginning of the year. It was in January. And uh, we were selected to go to Japan. There below, you see Mickey again on the uh, left-hand bottom side. Kunyuki Sensei right in back. And then to his left is George Harris. And then little me in between. <laughs> That's uh, Anton Giesink. Anton Giesink, uh, uh, for those of you who, who don't know, should know, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was the Olympic champion, that, that big Kaminaga. Um, and then also uh, uh, below him is Richard Fukua, Tosh Seno, and right to the, uh, to the left of Gisink is Phil Porter, famous Phil Porter, but even more famous, is Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who I roomed with for about a year in, uh, at Sacramento Judo Club. Uh, ben eventually became uh, a senator, a US senator. Uh, I was lucky enough to see him this past summer when we my girlfriend and I passed through uh, Colorado and met with him and his wife. And he was doing well. And he's quite an amazing guy. And we're lucky to have him within our, within our group of judoka. He's a good example to kind of emulate, along with many of the, the people that, were, that are in judo today. Uh, even as we look, as I look around in, in this panorama of uh, senseis that are here, uh, you're all great. You're all great people. Anyway, uh, that's, that's who those people were. But Anton Giesink, Jesus, he was just unbelievable. When I first got to Japan, I saw him in the Kodokan uh, standing with another guy named Blooming. Blooming was another Dutchman and they didn't like each other, I guess, but uh, they didn't work with each other. And Blooming was uh, quite a character too as well, but, but Anton Giesen, oh, unbelievable. I thought to, I didn't even know who he was. I just saw these two big guys and I just went up and worked with them. You gotta remember that 
back in 1964, 61, 62, uh, you didn't get very many pictures of people that were champions in the world. He was already uh, uh, up there. But I when I saw him at the Kodokan, I thought, I'm going to work with him and I'll show him what an American can do. <laughs> I went into Seoinage and I dragged as hard as I could and his head hit the ground in front of me like this. And then I looked back through my legs and I saw his feet are still planted on the ground. He's curled over me like this, he's curled over me. And I thought to myself, oh no. <laughs> I got up, he did an ogoshi on me and threw me. As big as he is, he did ogoshi, hit me in the chest with his butt, hit me in the chest and still lifted my legs up and threw me over. And it was a long ways down, <laughs> enough to pick up speed and bam, whoa. I had, he was I had an to amazing look up, guy. I had to look up Desync today. He's six foot six and he was 265, world champion in 61 and Olympic gold medalist in 64, um, Mr., Mr. Big. And I heard about him when I was about 14 years old about how he was a, not a Japanese and he'd won the world championships. Even then, that was something remarkable. And, and, the, and the first person with her hand up is Mickey Takamori. Go ahead, Mickey. Unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my question is, um, Hayward, who did you consider your greatest rival during your time as a competitor? Oh. Locally, my greatest rival was Tosh Seno. Tosh Seno had this incredible hanegoshi, uh, on par with what uh, Meki Chishida used to do. So locally, uh, it was uh, it was Tosh Seno. Nationally, um, my greatest rival was uh, Jim Bregman. Bregman was excellent and he trained very, very hard. He's one of the finest uh, technicians that, uh, that came back from Japan. So um, he was excellent. Those are the two that I really admire. Not just not just for their judo ability, but for their humanity as well. Rod, go ahead. Rod Condoregos. Uh, Sensei Nishioka, uh, first of all, thank you so much for doing this call. I'm like a kid in a candy shop because you're one of my idols since I've been a kid and watched you compete and followed you. And um, just amazing just to hear your background stories. Just uh, this is wonderful. Um, the question that I have is to help me to be a better uh, sensei coach. Uh, a mentor. Um, what and I think the I think the answer may change based on where you are in your judo life cycle. But what keeps you motivated? What keeps you motivated? Keeps you in the front of judo and being able to motivate others. I I want to tap in that and try to get close to if I could ever get close to what you do and share that with with my students at Obocon and other students as well. Rod, it's good to see you. You have that motivation inside of you already. You're one of the guys that I admire. <laughs> You're one of the leaders in in teaching others about judo. Your history at San Jose is excellent, and the ideas that uh, that you you portray to your students when you look at them. Uh, uh, and they they thank you not not so much vocally, but I'm sure by their eyes, by their actions, by the way that they look at you. That's what motivates me as well. 
that's what says to me, hey, I guess I'm doing the right thing. You know, when they smile, when they think about you, when they have you on their thoughts, uh, you think, well, maybe I might be doing the right thing. You're helping to make a better world. By the way, I didn't talk too much about this earlier, and I want to kind of talk about this right now, and this gives me a good chance. The way that we do judo today is different from what we had in the past. In the past, we walked into a dojo, and you can go from a beginner as a child all the way up to a senior teaching other people and all the, way, all the way through, you could find excellence at every level. That's partially changed as of 1980 or so when uh, they had this National Sports Act and they separated out in 2006, they separated out uh, USA Judo was not, no longer a mediating force for us but became a competitor of ours. And they competed rather than help. And I think that all of the people in this room, in this way, this group here, we're out there trying to help our students. I don't see that happening with USA Judo. And I would like to see that more. And I think that USJF, even through these kinds of programs and Zooms that Mitchell has put on for us, uh, does that. That creates those people that actually are looking at us and saying, thank you. They don't say it verbally, but it's there. And that's an important thing. And Rob, thank you for your question. Thank you, Sensei. I, I appreciate your answer. And I'm still yes. chasing what you teach, so thank you. I'll keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Eric Spears. Uh, uh, sensei, um, re reflecting uh, back on all your achievements and wins through, through your life, mm. which, which, which one do you feel most satisfying at this point in your life? Geez, I don't know. There's so many, so many things that are satisfying, but uh, I would have to say that if I were to remember some things, although I remember a lot and, of And things, I should qualify, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be judo, but, yeah. but so I'll I want to throw two, that in. I'll, I'll give you two instances. Um, one was when I felt... Uh, it was at the uh, Pan Am Games when I was able to win. I didn't understand because when you compete, you don't think about anything except competing. But when I stood on the victory stand and then the US flag went up and they played the Star Spangled Banner for the first time in my life, I thought to myself, God, I'm an American. I'm representing my country. I'm an American. Wow, that, that feeling uh, of belonging to a great country uh, was amazing for me. That's one. Another one, not so grand, but still uh, I relive it because I keep talking about it. And that was where, um, where a group of girls were laughing. We had just changed our physical education program to a co-educational one. They used to separate out the girls and the boys. The boys would do uh, PE over here, the girls would do PE over there, physical education in two separate locales. 
but then after Title IX, uh, everything was joined. These girls were laughing and screaming and yelling and having a good time. But I was trying to teach a class. And I said, ladies, ladies, calm down. What are you doing? I mean, I can't even hear my own voice. And they said, Mr. Nishioka, we've never picked anybody up before. We've never thrown somebody on the ground. We never had this kind of power. We never experienced anything like this. And I almost wanted to say to them, I'll go back to you laughing because it kind of said to me, see, you change people. You change the way that they think about themselves. It's, it's a physical thing that you're teaching, but it's a psychological mental thing that has evolved about. This is what's different. And I thought to myself, I'm doing what Kano wanted me to do. I'm changing people's lives. And that's something that uh, uh, I know that all of you out there are doing. You're changing people's lives. They may not say it, but it's there, it's there. Since Anishioka, I'd like to come back to that after we finish the next couple of questions, because uh, this is something that uh, we've talked about before, about that change and how fantastic judo can be. Uh, Dr. Menzel, Lorenzo Menzel, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, since Anishioka, in your long uh, career as a coach and as a competitor before that, and as a, a judo instructor at LA City College, um, what are some of the highlights that you've seen in the evolution or the changes in how we teach judo? Um, I don't think that there's much change in the, in the things that we teach. We still teach judo. We still teach the concepts of judo. And I think the one thing that we're sort of uh, drifting away from is the idea that this is where the physical and the mental come together. And through what we teach in the physical realm can be translated into your mental image of yourself and your thinking about how you act in, in, your, in your life and how you conduct your life uh, can be changed. I think this is a, an important thing that we have to really focus on and think about as we teach that we make a difference. We make a difference in everybody's lives. And if you're not making that difference, then you have to change to that. These are things that I kind of, uh, over a long period of time, see as a thing of value that lasts. Championships, wins, things like that, they don't last as long nor have as great an impact as your actions from, from those wins, from those experiences that you get from judo. And I'm, I, was, I was just walking this morning with my girlfriend and talking about this and, and saying, you know, things change after you do judo. The way that you think about things, the way that you act, uh, it changes you. And I hope that everybody that's here remembers that it's changed 
we do more things differently, of course. Uh, we have new programs that we have to kind of contend with. Um, now we have safe sport, now we have a uh, heads up, now we have all of these first aid, all of these other things that are in a sense related to judo. These are things that we have to kind of accept, utilize, and hopefully, uh, hopefully they are not things that that you have to really specially take a class for it's just natural that we should do these things we help one another that's what we do we help one another thank you and thank, thank you, you lorenzo for that question roy roy kawaji you're muted roy okay there you go hey guys uh thank you again the the question I, I wanted to ask uh, Ishoka Sensei, and I think a lot of you guys might agree on with me on this, is um, I always enjoy the stories when he talks about the past and how you know it was a pretty brutal sport, and I kind of get a kick out of it, you know, it's because the, the judo back then, and um, I wasn't, I don't think I ever trained as hard as Ishoka Sensei or some of you guys with that, you know, near death experience got pretty close to it but I think I'm kind of stuck in the middle of hearing all these stories of um, how judo used to be and how it is now and I think I personally feel that we were had great judo cars because the way judo was trained was really really tough and um, I'm trying to find a balance with it a lot of you guys might know that family reasons. I had to leave Portland. I'm in Hawaii now, so I'm helping a lot of the Hawaii students. And a lot of you guys know in Hawaii, Hawaii, everybody wants to be a cage fighter, you know? They're just really punchy kids, and they want to go really hard. And sometimes I think I've gotten soft <laughs> because um, I'm quicker to say, like, no, no, that's, that's you got you to ease off. That's not too much. But at the same time, I feel man if you if you guys can't take it you got to get out but is that if you think the guys cannot take a, how hard the judo practices are especially in a competitive club they should kind of go out or we should nurture them and keep them in but by doing that the caliber of the practices because we're like hey you know if you're going to go with someone that's not as good as you don't just beat on them pull them up pull them up you know so I can't find which is Nishoka Sensei. I don't know where. Yeah, Nishoka Sensei. You know, I, I, you know Roy, you you're, one yeah. of the, you're one of the leaders in, in teaching. You're one of the ones that we use as an example for, for how we teach. And I'm happy to hear that you have these problems, these ideas of how much effort should I push. And that's, that's, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. And my, my answer for you is this, find the level at which those people will respond the best. What is best for that group? When they get beyond that group that you're teaching and they need something extra, be able to say, you know what? You need to go there to this other club and get information from that other club that you don't you can't find here anymore because what got you here won't get you to there this other place that you want to go to and it's about finding the right spot for each person um, I had some parent a number of years ago say to me, well, you're just uh, too tough. And then I said, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Go to this other dojo. And I, I pushed him to that dojo. He came back to me and said, Sensei, thank you very much. That's what I needed. So you have to be able to see 
which one is the right place for that person and where that level is. And people will change. People change. Some, some people uh, can change and become that tough person that you want. Some people can't. And the ones that can't, send them to the place that best suits them, that makes them their very best. You're looking to build the very best, the very best you, the very best person that you could be. Mm -hmm. This is what we all strive for. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that is yet, but we look for it. And that's, that's what's important. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. You mentioned to me recently that the diminishing role of physical education and higher education isn't really um, a good trend. And there are such benefits of judo, including what we've called physicality and character strengthening. Uh, could you comment on that uh, at the university level? I know that you teach at that level. Uh, what, what do you see in the younger people today and the general attitude toward the, the, the physical benefits and the character building benefits of judo, are they appreciated at all? They only become appreciated when you as instructors mention them. This is a physical activity, but yet it has a lot of characteristics of character building, society building, values inside of the activity itself. Actually, uh, Jigoro Kano, here's a, here's an interesting thing. Jigoro Kano was an educator. Jigoro Kano was born into an era in which Japan was changing. It had to change from being a agrarian society to one of a urban society, one of an industrial society. And how are you gonna change that? What he first did was he brought judo into play. And here's the strange thing about judo and the ideas that he used he got these ideas from the West, from the West. These ideas were prevalent all over the place. John Dewey knew about them. John Dewey was an educator that went to Japan, had some conversations with uh, Kano, um, in, uh, and they exchanged letters. And, Kano took these ideas and changed a country that did not have very many games. The kinds of, of things like, like uh, gamesmanship. England had a lot of games. And, and I think we, we talked about that, uh, Chuck, where uh, at one of the wars, uh, the battles that were fought on the ba battlefield were actually won in the playing fields of Eton. And that was Wellington, you said, that said that, or was supposedly have said that. What, what that means is this, that concepts uh, that are learned in physical education, such as uh, bravery and and what is bravery? bravery? Bravery is doing something positive when there is this force against you that you think, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it, I'm too scared. But you fight that scared, afraid feeling and you go through with it and you do this thing that becomes a positive thing. And those things you do. Uh, and I think the story that I told you about was when I was uh, watching at a tournament, I saw this kid, he came on the mat, his eyes were red. I, he must've been crying before. 
he's maybe seven or eight, young kid. And I thought, wow. But he went out there, he fought. And near the end, he turned on uh, sort of like a counter and fell on top of the other guy. You could tell that he had meant to do that. And in that instant, he did that and he beat the other guy. And he came off kind of with a half smile on his face. What does that say to you? It's just an act of, oh, he won. He won, he lost. But it's more than that. He forced himself to get out there to do something that was brave. He showed bravery. That's something that came out of him. And every time that we practice, every time that we go against somebody that we're just a little bit afraid of and we push ourselves to do, that's an act of bravery. And when you see that, you should go up to the person and say, that was a brave act you did. Be able to recognize bravery and affirm that person, affirm him and say, hey, you did a great job. If you can do that, uh, I, think, I think you've done your job as a judoka, that you have shared your, yourself with him. Because most people don't know that it's bravery. They just do the act. Name it. Celebrate it. Be happy about it. Because you have changed that life now. You have changed that person and the way that he acts and the way that he thinks. So this is how we as instructors and you know, we'll be able to help people. And like what Roy said, he has this feeling of how much energy should you put? Put as much energy as is needed. Force as much energy as is needed to get the job done. Don't overwhelm the person. Don't be like Matsumoto Sensei who stick his hand in my face, but he saw that I was ready to do that. So anyway, you get a chance to, uh, to build on that. Uh, we all have a chance now. And we all have been doing these things in our dojos. We've been doing it all the way along. If we look at the promotional guidelines that we have in the JF, it says the first one of the first things is, is he an honorable person? Is he an honorable person? It's a value that is hard to explain, but it's a value that is very important for society. And we contribute to society. Know that. All of you know that experience. And I want to thank Hayward, Hayward for spending time with the judo community today. Uh, I'm sure that our attendees will take away many of his thoughts and use them in their own dojos and in their own lives. And, and such is the benefit of the judo community. So on behalf of the USGF, I thank you uh, for participating in, in our Zoom workshop with Sensei Nishioka and our moderator, Dr. Madani. Now, again, I'd like to thank them for their contribution to, to this great program that we have.